Clearly, this is something that's picked up not verbally, but through the feelings of the people around him. He knew he had to stop, and it was at that very moment that they stopped. They dipped the blades of the scythe into water. He tasted that water, and never did any water in his life ever taste as good as he thought then. As in many other Tolstoyan moments, conscious thought was the enemy of good results. That task which is felt well, which is felt well, is also done well. Or to upset the old proverb, the watch pot boils badly. This is, of course, stated by the very same Tolstoy, who analyzes every action and feeling of his characters, even the dogs and the horses. If you're looking for consistency, I'm afraid Tolstoy is not the place to look. If you're looking for life, that's a different story. So it's hardly surprising to discover that Gleevian, after feeling the ordered attractiveness of the Russian countryside, abandons his idea of finding marital happiness with a peasant woman. He sees Kitty riding by in carriage. He realizes she's the only possible woman for him. Well, Gleevian girds his loins and decides he will now meet Kitty in the Oblonsky house, where Oblonsky has invited him with great enthusiasm. We suddenly see Levin in a situation very close to something that happened in Tolstoy's life. As a matter of fact, what Tolstoy does in this novel is repeated almost exactly for word, word for word and syllable by syllable by what he said to Sofia Andreevna, his real wife, when he proposed to her, naturally, how a Tolstoyan proposal would take place. They are in Oblonsky's household in Moscow. Kitty, who now wants Levin very much to propose to her, has sat down at a card table which is covered with a green cloth. She's playing with chalk. She's covered the green cloth with patterns she made with the chalk. Levin suddenly picks up the chalk. And of course, this is in translation. He writes the letters W-Y-A-I-C-N-B-D-Y-M-T-O-N. He waits for Kitty to puzzle it out. She looks very hard as if to say, what's the devil's going on? And suddenly it occurs to her, these letters stand for, when you answered, it cannot be, which is the marriage. Did you mean then or never? She is so close to the way he feels and so sensitive to the way he feels that she deciphers these letters. So she takes the chalk and now it's her turn. She writes T-I-C-N-A-O. Now it's his turn to figure it out. And finally he reads it and says, then I could not answer otherwise. Then she writes the letter T-Y-M-F-A-F-W-H, that you might forgive and forget what happened, and it's clear that they will be married. In preparing for the wedding, Levin decides that he must be absolutely open and honest with his new wife. He therefore gives her his diaries to read, so she'll know what kind of a man she's chosen to share her conjugal life. To her horror, she reads in the many way that he, as a young man, has strayed from the straight and narrow. This most especially includes many sexual episodes with women. This causes her to weep, to weep bitterly, but in the end she realizes that he's confronted his impulses and is ready to accept openly the challenges of married life. This episode is very close to what happened to Tolstoy himself when he married Sofia Andreevna. Of course, Tolstoy goes into a very long description of the wedding. You understand that in a Russian Orthodox wedding, each one is supposed to wear a crown and they are united when these crowns are tied together. Each person tries to put his or her crown lower than the other one to show the other person was above that person in feeling. Yevian is now attached to Kitty, and he begins to understand what a genuine conjugal relationship means in a person's life. This is something quite new for Yevian. Yevian is a man who was previously accustomed to having lived a very independent life, to doing whatever he wanted, going wherever he wanted, doing wherever he wanted. Now he constantly has to take into account the feelings of his spouse with whom he's in a conjugal relationship. One time, he comes home late. He was out in the fields, was busy, didn't think of getting home on time. Kitty's very angry with him. She says, how come you came home late? Don't you understand? You made me worried. This is terrible. You can't do this kind of thing. And he even gets very angry. After all, it was quite reasonable for him to be out in the countryside. She had to understand that. He had to, he had to do this. Suddenly, they start fighting with each other, and Davian discovers something very strange. He gets angry at Kitty because she think, he thinks she's being quite unreasonably angry with him. Being angry with her, he suddenly realizes that in lashing out verbally to her, he's actually lashing out at himself. He realizes that he and Kitty, his body and Kitty's body, his soul and her soul, his nervous system and her nervous system have come together. There is one. Anytime he lashes out against her, or anytime he does anything to her with her, he does it to or with himself. How does a person who's previously been independent manage to get into a life like this? 
This brings us back to the discussion we had when we were talking about the underground man and the difficulty of having freedom and love at the same time. Dostoevsky tries to work this out with the character of Christ in the notion of genuine Christianity. In Tolstoy's case, this will obviously be worked out in a very different way. So it's not, it's not so easy to be connected that way in spite of the fact that Davian wants to be free. Then another thing happens. A man named Vasinki Vyslovsky comes to visit Levin's estate. You know that when you live in the countryside, it's nice to have visitors. Here a man has come along, dressed very stylishly in a scotch plaid. He's a man who obviously knows what it's like to be in society, who knows what it's like to make people like you. He engages in what's uh, quite conventional for that time, a light flirtation with Kitty. He doesn't mean to do anything nasty with it, but after all, Kitty's an attractive young woman, and he tries to make her like him. This is his way of trying to fit into the household. Now, of course, in Gavin's eyes, this is something absolutely outrageous. Nobody else could get close to Kitty. It is he that is close to Kitty. That may be painful and a hard thing to deal with at times, but she is his conjugal wife. The two of them are close, and anybody who tries to come in between is somebody who makes Gavin deeply furious. Uh, they, go, they, that is to say, Vyslovsky and Gavin, go out in the field. Gavin's so angry he can't quite control himself. He takes some thick sticks, and in front of Yaslovsky's eyes, he breaks these sticks to show what kind of muscles he has and what a the difficult person he would be to the tangle with. He, he also realizes he's making something of a fool of himself, particularly in the eyes of the society around him, but he knows he cannot stand for this. Finally, he brings himself the courage to say, look, you're going to have to leave. Yaslovsky says, why? I don't understand. Have I done something to offend you? He even answers, look, don't ask me to explain it. Just leave. This is the total breaking of all kind of polite relationships in ordinary society. Vyslovsky says, but please explain to me, what's going on? Levin says, look, don't ask for an explanation. And again, he breaks another stick. He says, go. Well, <laughs> Vyslovsky has no alternative. He go back to the house, pack up his goods higgly-piggly as quick as he can. They put him in a trap, which is an old form for horse-drawn carriage. There he is, going away with a scotch plaid hanging over the side. His baggage is all messed up on the trap, cutting a ridiculous figure. People look at Gavin as if he's gone out of his mind. Oblonsky says, what are you doing? What's the point of all this? You're behaving absolutely absurdly. Gavin says, yes, I know I'm acting absurdly, but I'm acting the way I have to. Several hours later, they're all laughing about it. Well, it's all very well, of course, for Levin to be jealous, and we can understand, I suppose, how he might be jealous. But then, a little bit later, Anna and Vronsky are staying on an estate that is not very far from where Levin is living. For some reason, he decides to visit that estate. He's heard what Anna has done, and in his own mind, he condemns her very seriously, since she's engaged in a relationship that no human being should. This is a real sin in Levin's eyes. He looks at her as a sinning woman, very much in light of that epigraph I told you about before, Vengeance is mine, saying the Lord, saith the Lord, and I will requite. It's the way a person from a very fanatical Christian point of view might judge a sinner. However, to his amazement, to Levin's amazement, when he actually meets Anna, he finds a rather attractive woman. I don't mean attractive only in the physical sense. He finds a woman who knows how to talk with him, who understands some of his ideas. Levin had very unconventional ideas about the way Russia should go, how farms should be run, and many different ideas of a great individualist. But to his amazement, Anna seemed to understand him at half a word. Whereas, when he tried to talk to his half-brother, when he tried to talk to his fellow aristocrats, they thought, my gosh, what a strange fellow. They couldn't make heads or tails of what he was trying to say. Here, Anna who was this person whom he had previously been ready to condemn, understanding him at half a word. He finds himself beginning to be taken in, and perhaps not only by words, perhaps by something else in Anna's personality. You can see why Vronsky was attracted to her. You can see why almost any man would be attracted to her. Only half consciously, seeing what's going on, he goes back home and he says to his wife, rather unwisely, I might say, you know, the judgment that society is making on Anna is really not justified at all. This is a rather remarkable woman who is as much sinned against as she is sinning. <laughs> Can you imagine his wife's reaction? She has the impression that Anna has, has succeeded at least halfway in seducing her husband. And she's as furious at Gavin, uh, as Gavin had been to Vasily Vyslovsky, who tried to engage with a light flirtation with his wife. So Kitty is furious with him, and all of a sudden he's getting a taste of his own medicine. That's not so pleasant. Levin feels that very deeply 
and very painfully. Tolstoy shows us very clearly what genuine conjugal life is like. Yes, of course, there is deep love, attraction, and even satisfaction for two people working together for the sake of a family, for the sake of work on a farm, for the sake of whatever work has to be done with a family, and of course for the sake of their mutual love. But at the same time, there are very deeply painful aspects of what he sometimes calls Simeonia Scestia, that is, family happiness, which, by the way, was the title of, a, of another novel that Tolstoy wrote later on. At the end of this novel, Anna Karenina, Yevin tries to work it out, and undoubtedly, so does Tolstoy. Somehow or other, Yevin is going to have to find a Christian epiphany, which, when he finds it, is going to solve his problems. At one point, he suddenly realizes that to be a believing Christian does not necessarily mean that you're not going to get angry, or that you're going to avoid all human weaknesses, or that you're going to become an angel rather than a human being. With this faith, Yevon will be willing to face the world. This, by the way, is very close to a faith that Tolstoy thought he had worked out for himself. Of course, in Tolstoy's case, you can imagine how long this lasts, a day or two, until he finds a new faith that he turns to. Tolstoy's mind was of a sort that could never stop searching, seeking, and looking at aspects of all human life. This has been caught in an essay by a very wise critic. Uh, that critic's name is Isaiah Berlin, who unfortunately died not too long ago, I think in the last year, year and a half. He was a remarkable man who was born in Latvia, which is part of Russia in those days, but brought up in England and worked at Oxford University. He wrote a remarkable essay that I strongly recommend that you read. It's very short and doesn't take very long. It's called The Hedgehog and the Fox, and the idea is something like this. He quotes an ancient Greek proverb that says, The fox knows many things, the hedgehog knows but one. By that he means that the fox explores all aspects of the field. His defenses run all around the countryside, whereas the hedgehog has only that one central defense. Well, if your hands have ever been pierced by a hedgehog quill, you know what I'm talking about. Isaiah Berlin says, all writers have been divided into hedgehogs and foxes. The greatest fox was Shakespeare, whose characters run the gamut of all, hu of all human beings, from the apothecary to the noble, to the peasant, to the man, to the woman, to the old, the young, everyone. He's the fox. He explores all aspects of the field. He runs all across humanity and every part of humanity and every single character is individual, unique in its own way. And of course, you know how, how Shakespeare animates his characters. On the other hand, the opposite of this would be the hedgehog. And the greatest hedgehog would be either Dante or Dostoevsky because both of them saw some central salvation which could be achieved and which, could, which illuminates their entire work. Dante, of course, finds it in Beatrice, that beautiful woman which he identifies with the Holy Mother of God and through whose beauty he feels he can get to a kind of Christianity and, of course, a kind of love that is the highest thing in the world and in the heavens above. Dostoevsky sees it in the idea of Christ, the most courageous, the most insightful, the most sensitive uh, of anything that has ever hit this world. For Dostoevsky, Christ is that very, very special quality which uh, is the highest thing in the world and through which he will achieve his salvation. So that both Dostoevsky and Dante in uh, Isaiah Berlin's eyes are beautiful examples of the hedgehog. Now, Tolstoy, says Isaiah Berlin, and in my opinion this is brilliant, Tolstoy is born to be a fox but he would like to make himself into a hedgehog. Here's the creator of war and peace, who saw humanity from all directions and all corners of the field, whether it was the hunting field, the war field, or the family field. He was desperate to find some central idea which would illuminate the, the entire thing. Of course, at the end of Anna Karenina, he thinks he's found it, but it's not going to work, because a genuine fox, as a writer, can never turn himself into a hedgehog.